right, tonight we're in chapter 15 of um, 2 Samuel. We're in chapter 15 of 2 Samuel. And in case I didn't say this, I don't think I said this last week. Once you get past chapter 12, chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and even a little bit of 17 can be labeled this way. All of my children. Um, I know that sounds like a soap opera. And um, actually, it kind of is. Because after David fell in chapter 11, and it was revealed to him in chapter 12, um, David is morally bankrupt. He cannot handle his children. I mean, we talked about the rape of Tamar in chapter 13 from Amnon. God awful bad scene. David's having to live out this sword being never departing from his house. And then chapter 14, uh, last week, David, David misses him, but he doesn't quite know how to invite him back in. So after this witch, um, um, after this wise lady asked, did, did this riddle with David, David invited him back to the city, but didn't invite him to his um didn't invite him back into his heart to have rich, warm fellowship with him. Um, David's having to deal with his children. Matter of fact, by the end of chapter 14 last week, if you can remember, here it is Absalom begging for audience with Joab so that Joab can possibly get him before his father. And we see him um, there prostrate before his father, but there's something about his heart. He's angry, he's bitter, he's vengeful against his father. And that's where we are tonight with chapter 15. With this conspiracy um, that um, Absalom brings up, that this coup, Absalom wants to overthrow his father. He wants to literally, uh, well he does, steal the heart of the people of Jerusalem, the people of God from his father. I mean, it's just a big old mess. But David really gets to see who's on his side and who's not on his side. I mean, it's tough. He gets to see who's loyal and who's not so loyal. This isn't in my notes, but I got to ask the question. Can y'all handle one, a question before I start? Have you ever thought somebody was going to be a friend to the end? Only to look back and that person was the one stabbing you in the back? Okay, wrong church. Sometimes you call them backstabbers. Yeah, I've been there before. When I thought I had some friends to the end, but they were only friends for the moment. They were only friends for a season and not for a reason. And that's what we have here in um, 2 Samuel chapter 15. I mean, the word that I want to start off with tonight is enticement. Enticement. Because here's Absalom trying to entice the people. Now, I want to tell you that Absalom personifies everything that, that God hates. Absalom personifies everything that God hates. And if you want a good list of what God hates, you should look over in the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, verse 16 through 19. And you can see every last one of those things that God hates in Absalom. But here he is in verse 1. Now it came about after this that Absalom provided for himself a chariot and horses and 50 men as runners before him. This guy is already getting his military weapons together. He's getting his supporters together. Saul is um, making some moves behind his father's back. In verse 2, it said, Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. And when any man had a suit to come to the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, um, from what city are you? And he would say, your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, see, your claims are good, 
and right. But no man listens to you on the part of the king. He's criticizing his father's administration. I mean, and he's slick about it. He gets up early. Now, imagine um, party A coming in first and then party B coming in second. Absalom tells party A that if I were the king, I would rule on your behalf. Then when party A moves on, party B comes on, and he hears their claim against party A, he said, if I were king, I'd rule on your behalf because you're right. He was being manipulative. He was being cunning. He was literally winning the hearts of the people. Say, I would rule in your favor. Verse 4, it says, Moreover, Absalom would say, Oh, that one would appoint me judge in the land. Then every man who has any suit or cause could come to me, and I would give him justice. Wait a minute, Absalom. You can't provide justice or you can't provide what you think everyone needs. Somebody's going to be wrong and somebody's going to be right. And sometimes both parties are going to be wrong. There's no way you can do it. But that wasn't his goal. It says in verse 5, And when a man came near to prostrate himself before him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom dealt with all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole away the hearts of the men of Israel. Literally stole their hearts away. <coughs> he used flattery. He used um, this, this charming personality that he had. He could charm. He exercised charm. He, he was literally saying, I could rule better than my daddy can. If you would just elect me, I would do better. And here's David reaping the seeds of his lack of friendship with his son in chapter 14. Reaping the harvest of what happened in chapter 11. He's reaping the sword being his house like it talks about in chapter 12. With his son, who's good looking, who's charming, who knows how to use flattery um, to win people's heart, to win their hearts to his side. You know, I don't want to ever um, allegorize the scriptures because I think the scriptures are good just the way it is. But you know, there's sometimes I, I, I meet people that are just like Absalom along the way. They know how to use flattery. They know how to use their looks. They know how to use their hair just the right way. And you know what? And I'm going, oh, my goodness. And, and I'm so turned off by flattery because I realize flattery is just trying to use manipulation to get what you want. Just want to remind all of us that nobody gets away with flattery forever. Of course, in verse 7, here it goes. Now, it came about at the end of 40 years that Absalom said to the king. Now, can I put a question mark beside this 40 years? It's saying 40 years, but I think it's four years instead of 40 years. It's the way that the translators translated it in the um, original manuscripts. Um, I believe there was a little something wrong here because I believe that Absalom is around um, B.C. 980 to B.C. 976. So that would be 40 years. So Absalom didn't wait till he became an old man to do this. He was actually a young man doing this. So I think that's a stribal error in your, in your text there. And I think the better answer would probably be four years instead of 40 years. Another reason why I believe this is because David wasn't on his throne for 40 years. He was, he was in Hebron for seven and a half, 
and then he was in Jerusalem for 33, which makes up the 40 years, but he was not in one place for 40 years. So I think the, the right answer here, are y'all still with me or am I by myself? Okay, the way y'all was looking at me like, we ain't, we ain't comfortable being in no classroom tonight. I'm just trying to explain why I think it's four years instead of 40 years. He says, please let me go and pay my vow, which I, which, which I have vowed to the Lord in Hebron. Now, why would he want to go to Hebron? Remember what I just said? David was king there for seven and a half years. Let me, let me, let me, let me go back now. Who was born in Hebron? Absalom was born in Hebron. He was in Miss King's class and Miss Stevens' class. He was in Miss Townsend. Y'all get what I'm trying to do here. He, he has a base of operation. I mean, he's one of them because he's a homeboy from Hebron. So maybe he wants to go back to Hebron to start his coup because he realizes that he'd have the most support from the city of his birth. He says, for you, in verse 8, for your servant vowed a vow while he was leaving in Gersher of Aram, saying, if the Lord shall indeed bring me back to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. The king said to him, go in peace. Shalom. So he arose and went to Hebron. I mean... Looking back on this, you can almost smell the messiness of this. He wanted to get to Jerusalem. Now he wants to go back to Hebron. Wonder what's David thinking about all of this. And of course, in verse 10, we get a little clarity on Absalom's insight. Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom is king in Hebron, place of his birth, place where he would have the most support, place that he would be the strongest because he was in Miss Townsend. He was in, he was in, he was in all these other people's class and maybe they remember him. Then 200 men went with Absalom from Jerusalem who were invited and went innocently, and they did not know anything. And Absalom sent for Ahithophel, Ahithophel, excuse me, um, the Gilonite, David's counselor. Now, Ahithophel was um, Bathsheba's grandfather, and um, he sent for him while he was offering these sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong. And the people increased continually with Absalom. Now, why was a Ahithophel there? Maybe because he was seeking a little bit of um, what's that? This is this is a nasty word. Can y'all handle one nasty word? He was handle, he he was seeking a little revenge for what happened with his granddaughter and her family, and maybe he was using this as an occasion to get back at David. Maybe his true feelings were coming out. Of course, there's another word now. We call it the escape. In verse 13, here's what's going on. Then a messenger came to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. Wow. Do you remember back in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1? Of course you do. Verses 1, 2, and 3. They gave the, this place to David as a gift. They must have been Indian givers because now they want their gift back. Now they're giving it to Absalom. Absalom would steal the hearts of the people from his father David. And David, of course, in verse 14 says, um, to all the servants who are with him at Jerusalem, arise and let us flee, for otherwise none of us will escape from Absalom. Go in haste, or he will overthrow us quickly, 
and bring down calamity on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. David didn't just care about the people. David also cared about the city in which God placed him in, and that was Jerusalem. Of course, verse 15 said, Then the king's servant said to the king, Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king chooses. Wow. What manner of obedience. Whatever you choose, king, we're still with you. I love this attitude of David's man here. Whatever you choose for us to do, we're going to do it. You know, 2 Samuel 15, verses 15 through 18, reminds us of this. The king's servants model true service by offering to do whatever David needed them to do. Whatever you need me to do, I'm willing to do it. You know, I know this is not a Sunday morning service, but can I preach just a little bit? Do you share the same kind of heart? Whatever, whatever the Lord needs me to do, I'll do it. Do you, do you make yourself available to the Lord? Okay, that's easy. Yeah, I make myself available to the Lord. How about to your pastor and to ministry leaders? Do you make yourself available? Whatever they ask me to do, I want to be, I, I, I want to be honoring to God and do it. If it's in my ability, I want to do it. But for so many people, they come to church and they're more spectators than participators. I know, I'm sorry. Wrong church. I, I take that back. I take, can I take that back? Don't, don't. I thought I was in the church down the street. Because so many people will look and say, if I, were, if I were doing it, I would do it a different way. But the problem is, y'all want to hear what the problem is? You ain't doing anything. Stop being a spectator and start being a participator. Lord, if I was over the children's ministry, I'd be doing it this way. When are you going to start volunteering then? If I was over the youth ministry, I would definitely do something different over here. Okay, sign up. Let's, let's, let's check in. Let's see what you can do. If I was cooking the Wednesday night, don't mess up the Wednesday night meal. Don't mess up the Wednesday night meal. Let's forget that one. A a amen, somebody. <laughs> let's, let's forget that one. If I was over the women's ministry, if I was over the men's ministry, come on. Um, don't just come and be a spectator. Be a participator. And here's David and his men. They're saying, David, we're with you. I like that, guy, that kind of carrying on. Because you see it in verse 16. You see it in verse 17 and 18, just like you saw it in verse 15. Back up to verse 15 real quick, brother. He says, and I bold it for you there so you can see it. Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my Lord the King chooses. Now, I know somebody's sitting there and you're going, well, David wasn't always right. David, David took another man's wife. David, David didn't know how to handle his own children. I know, I know. But as soon as it was pointed out to David, David got it right. As soon as it's pointed out to you, you need to get it right too. Uh, that's, that, that was good Sunday morning preaching right there. I'm going to say amen to myself. Because all of us will make mistakes from time to time. It's not the fall. It's in the getting up. When you find out you're doing something wrong, hey, submit yourself to God. God, I will change. Okay, verse 16, because y'all don't like preaching on Wednesday night. So, so, so the king went out. And all his household with him. But the king left ten concubines to keep the house. Can I just tell you what this verse says to me? David fully expected to return to Jerusalem. He fully expected to return to Jerusalem. Um, he was fleeing an attack. He was not going into exile. He was just getting away from an attack. And... I pray this is not cocky. I pray this is not cocky. And I pray I'm not reading too much into the scriptures. David might have been taking pity on him because he didn't want to take his life. 
Just because the old man is running don't mean the old man is out of tricks. Okay, I'm at the wrong church to be talking like that. Okay, verse 17. The king went out and all of his people with him, and they stopped at the last house. Why did he stop at the last house? Did any of y'all watch cowboy um, um, shows? Any of y'all watch Gunsmoke and y'all, y'all, I'm at the wrong church, Rifleman and all those kind of shows? Maybe he stopped at the last house because he wanted to take one more look. One more look at Jerusalem and its glory. And um, as he's, take, he's fully intended to return, but just in case, I want to remember it like it is. So he takes that last look. Verse 18, now all the servants passed on beside him, all the Cherethites, all the Pelethites, and all the Gittites, 600 men who come with him from Gath, pass on before the king. Wait a minute. He had some Philistines with him? Um, I think they were kind of like maybe mercenary soldiers that he had with him at this point. But David takes that one more look. 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 19 through 23 tells us this day. Ittai expressed his friendship by being a companion to David. Here's, I want to do a good job on this one. Verse 19, 20, and 21. Then the king said to Ittai, the Gittai, why will you also go with us? Return and remain with the king, for you are a foreigner. You're not even one of us. You're a foreigner. And also um, in exile, return to your own place. You came only yesterday. Let me give you some Andre Rogers way to interpret this. You don't have anything to do with this. Get out while you can. Why are you going with me? And he says, and shall, I, and shall I tomorrow make you wander with us while I go where I will? Return and go back, and return and take back your brothers. Mercy and truth be with you. And Ittai answered the king and said, as the Lord lives, And as my Lord the King lives, surely wherever my Lord the King may be, whether for death or for life, there also your servant will be. Okay, I'm at the wrong church. Isn't that cool? It kind of reminds me of Ruth chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Wherever you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Um, when you die, I will die. You know, I love that kind of talk. And here is David's, he's not even a homeboy, he's a foreigner. But he says, wherever you go, David, I'm with you. I mean, you can't help but to read 2 Samuel, and you really get a sense of who's on David's side and who's against David. And Itai said, I'm not going anywhere. This is the Andre Rogers interpretation of this. I ain't going nowhere. I I ain't got nowhere else to be. I'm going to be with you. If we live, we live. If we die, we die. If I use this word here, will I mess y'all up? I'm a ride or die. Okay, y'all okay with me saying that? Okay. I'm a ride or die. I have a pastor friend. His name is Andre Melvin. And um, Andre Melvin and I, been, we, we've been knowing each other about 22, 23 years. It felt like we was at the same nursery together because this guy is my friend. I mean, when things have gone well, Andre Melvin has been right there with me. When things hadn't gone so well, Andre Melvin has been out. He's always been there with me. Um, 
He's my ride or die. Now, I do have an earthly brother. His name is Michael, and I love my brother Michael. But there ain't nothing like Andre Melvin. He's my kind of people. I remember um, a few years ago, his father passed. And uh, when his father passed, he called me up. He said, my daddy just passed. Must have been 2 o'clock in the morning. Ten minutes later, I was at his door. And I sat with him till the next morning. Um, when he had his daddy's funeral, I was right there up in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. Because he's my ride and die. I was glad to be there with him. My, my parents were in good health, uh, but all of a sudden my mom died three years ago. Four years ago this May. And um, I had to ask the Lord, what doest thou this? And um, I, didn't, I, I wasn't ready for her to go. And um, first person showed up, Andre Melvin. He said, I'm with you, Doc. And you know when you know you're good friends? When you can sit there and not say a word. But boy, you're in a room together. That's Andre T. Melvin. You know, we didn't know it. His mother came to my mother's funeral one week. And two weeks later, his mother died. And um, we had to bury her. And I was right there at the graveside with my, with my brother as he said goodbye to his mother. But then he got up and he told the church something, messed me up, because he's the only child. He said, I guess I don't have anybody else in this world now. He said, but I know I got one person. And he said, that's Andre Rogers. We're going to be brothers to the end. And you know what? Something leaped in me. I said, you're right. And I got up right in the midst of the service and hugged that brother. To let him know that I'm with him. I, I just wanted to tell you that story. Do you have those kind of people in your life today? They may not be blood kin, but boy, you have that connection with them, and you have that ride or die connection. Andre Melvin is my ride or die. He's so ride or die until I told him yesterday he's gonna have to take me to lunch tomorrow. And I said, You pay for it. He said, I pay for it, Doc. I love my brother. God just sometimes put people in your life that make a difference in your life. Oh, by the way, I told you that story for another reason. Maybe you haven't been that kind of person. Maybe you, you call yourself, let me get the word right, an introvert. And you don't really like people. You, you, you want people to stay out your face and leave you alone. That's leave you alone if y'all don't get what I was saying. <laughs> Maybe God wants you to operate outside of your comfort zone and be there for someone else. I got, I got a person on my team at school who says, I don't hug nobody. I, I, okay, I ain't trying to hug you. And um, over the last two years, he's gone from, I don't hug nobody. So I can't wait to see you every morning so I can give you a hug. I said, dude, I thought you don't hug nobody. Get up off of me. Because when you've been there for people and you love them through their mess, you know, I wonder how many more people would come to Calvary if you would just open your mouth. Let people know that you're there for them. Let them know that you're a ride or die kind of person. Let them know that you can handle their mess. Okay, I'm in the wrong church. What, what, what was I at again? As the Lord lives. Do you think Itai knew that David had some mess in his life? As long as the Lord lives. Do you think he knew anything about that Bathsheba situation? As long as the Lord lives. Do you think he knew anything about that Absalom situation? As long as the Lord lives. And as my Lord the King lives. Surely... Wherever my Lord the King may be, whether for death or for life, there also your servant 
will be. David said, go take care of your own affairs. He said, I am taking care of my own affairs. You are my affair. And I'm going to take care of you, king. That's got to be good stuff. Verse 22 says, therefore David said to Ittai, go and pass over. So Ittai the Gittite um, passed over with all of his men and all the little ones who were with him. While all the country was weeping with a loud voice, all the people passed over. The king also passed over the brook Kendram. And all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. Now behold, Zadok also came, and all the Levites with him came the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God, and Abathar came up until all the people had finished passing the city. This is where it's about to get good, you all. 2 Samuel chapter 15, verses 24 through 29. Zadok and Abathar became informants to make sure their friend had the information that he needed to guarantee his welfare. Here's what David says in verse 25. The king said to Zadok, return the ark of God to the city. Wait a minute. Return the ark of God? I thought if we kept it out here, we'd get some kind of protection from having the ark of God. No, take the ark of God back to the city. He says, here's how much he submits to God's authority, to God's sovereignty. He said, if I find favor in the sight of the Lord, then he will bring um, me back again and show me both it and his habitation. That's got to be good stuff there. That he trusted the Lord enough that I don't have to keep the ark. Wait a minute now. I remember in 1 Samuel, okay, y'all Bible readers, y'all still with me? That they went and got the Ark of the Covenant because they thought it would overthrow the Philistines. And the Ark of the Covenant didn't do anything for it. It was almost like God folded his hand. He said, you didn't want me before this battle. Why should I help you in this battle? But here is David says, I trust the Lord so much. Take the Ark of the Covenant back to the holy city. Because if God shows me favor, we'll make it back. But if he should say, verse 26, I have no delight in you. Behold, he am I. Let him do to me as seems good to him. The king said to Zodai, the priest, um, are you not a seer? Return to the city in peace and your two sons with you, Ahasmas and um, Jonathan, the son of Abathar. Wow. Wow. I could go on and on there. Verse 28. He says, see, I'm going to wait for the foes, foes of the um, wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. Therefore, Zodai and Abathar returned the ark of God to Jerusalem and remained there. And David went up to the ascent of the Mount of Olives, and he wept as he went. His head was covered. And he walked barefooted. The reason why he walked barefooted, it was a walk of shame. That's what it meant in the ancient world. That someone on our Lord's level as David would walk barefooted. Then all the people who were with him each covered his head and went up weeping as they went. And here's our close tonight. 2 Samuel 15 verses 30 through 37. Hushai was willing to hazard his own safety to defend David in the presence of his enemies. Verse 31. Now someone told David, saying, um, um, Othophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray, make the counsel of Othophel of foolishness. It happened as David was coming to the summit where God was worshipped, that behold, Hushai met him with the coat torn and dust in his head. And David said to him, if you pass over with me, 
then you will be a burden to me. Well, it says in verse 34, but if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I have been with your father's, um, your father's servant in the past, so I will be, with, be your servant. He was like his personal chaplain. Then you can toward the counsel of Ahithophel um, for me. Are not Zodiac and Abathar the priests with you there? So it shall be that whatever you hear from the king's house, you shall report to Zodiac and Abathar the priest. Behold, the two sons are there. Ahasmus, Ahasmus um, Zodite's son, and Jonathan, Abathar's son. And by them you shall send me everything that you hear. So Hushai, David's friend, came to the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. Well, this chapter is all about friendship. Someone once said, once somebody shows you who they are, you need to believe them. Absalom is a negative example. But David's supporters show the most positive example in Scripture. And here's a Scripture that I give you. Um, Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 39. If you allow me, I, I just want to turn over there and read it for you real quick. That's Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 39. Here's, here's what it says. It's a very familiar part of Scripture. Um, Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Do you all believe that tonight? I want to challenge you to be a better friend this year. To be a better friend to your neighbor this year. To be the kind of friend that people can depend on. You say, I'm already the kind of pe person that people can depend on. Well, find you someone else. Spread it out for the kingdom of God. Be the best friend you can be. At work tomorrow, don't, be, don't get caught up in the gossip at work and gossip about somebody else. Be the best friend you could possibly be. Maybe if you're in school, be the best friend you could possibly be. Um, maybe in your neighborhood, be the best friend that you can possibly be. Because these friends of David's, really have taught me something, that um, even when life is messy, it doesn't mean I agree with the mess, but I can still be there for someone else. Now, my time is gone, and Joe has already stood up as if I'm supposed to stop because he stood up. But can I, can I give you some homework this week? Amen. Joe, can I, can I take 30 seconds to give him some homework? But I, okay, Joe said I can take 20 seconds. I want you to read the book of Psalms this week. I want you to read Psalms 3 and 4. Write these down. I want you to read Psalm 39 and Psalm 41. I want you to read Psalm 55, Psalm 61, 62, and 63. And I want you to read Psalm 143. And I know somebody's asking, that sure is a lot of homework. Why do you want me to read all those Psalms? Because I want you to read David's feelings as he's in the wilderness. Um, not in exile, but he's escaping a type from his son. And I want you to read how David feels while he um, takes refuge in the wilderness away from um, Absalom. And these psalms will give you some insight on David's feelings. Now, if I was confident that you all were standing here to 10 or 11 o'clock, I would go over every last one of those songs. But since I know the crowd that I'm speaking to, I'll just give you a homework assignment and let y'all, don't, don't moan when I'm talking. I just want to give you a homework assignment. And, and if, you, if you don't mind, if you just do, 
is one, two, three, four, five, six. I put them in groups for you. So if you'll read that between this week and next week, when we read about the death of Absalom, it will make so much sense what a parent is going through that's not only lost the relationship and the fellowship of a father, of a parent, of a brother, and a friend, but you have some critical insight on what David feels, even for his love for Israel and his love for God is greater than his love for his son. Oh, I promise you, if you take some moments, you take some time to really get into this. George, if you just glance over it, I guarantee you, you'll say next Wednesday night will be. George, I'm sorry I called your name. Um, I was looking at your wife because she was smiling at you. Uh, it'll be worth it all if you just take a moment and just, are y'all still with me on this side of the room? You just take a moment and glance at this, and we'll have a time next week. Pray for Pastor Steve as he continues to recover. Um, he didn't sound the best, but God is a healer, and God's going to bring our brother back. Amen? Amen? Let me pray for us. I hope you got something out of what we shared tonight. Be a better friend this year. Amen, church? Amen. Be the kind of friend that wins people because you're doing it out of the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ.